Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team, and more. Today is our segment-based episode. So today, we're going to cover three topics, the first one being how to handle social situations on prep. This one's going to be led by Coach Sue. The second one is going to be training considerations for clients deep into prep, led by myself, Coach Austin. That's also going to include just general prep overview as well. And then number three, the prep to prep led by coach Alex. So what you can expect from today's episode is for each topic or question to be sort of put on the clock for about 10 to 15 minutes. The coach leading the topic or question will start the discussion. This will then be followed up by the other coaches weighing in with their thoughts and experience. As always, it is our goal not only to supply you, the listener with valuable insights on the topics or questions, but also just plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, let's get into today's first topic, which is going to be how to handle social situations on prep. So Sue, I'm going to ask you, how can one successfully handle social, social, wow, starting this (laughs) one off strong, social situations while in a prep? Yeah. So some of these are definitely going to, um, be able to be usable within social situations, within diving. Of course, within a prep, it is a little bit more extreme and you have to be a little bit more on top of things than just within a lifestyle diet. So recognize that this is specifically talking about prep. So if some of these seem extreme for you in a social situation, apply that to your own life and your own circumstance if you are not in prep. Because again, there is just going to be more strictness in prep because you have a timeline, you're trying to be elite at something. There are going to be things you kind of have to give and take with. And with that, that concept of being elite, I think that when it comes to competitors, because it's not um, like a something within like an Olympic sport, where if you're a, an Olympic track athlete, you're with the team always, you're in there with your coach getting the practices done. Um, and you think about those people as elite. But then when you think about bodybuilding competitions, it's something that you can do in your own home on your own time. And so the elite level of what's expected out of an Olympian in regards to the athlete in the traditional way versus like someone trying to become an Olympian within bodybuilding kind of have a skewed perception and recognizing that if you are trying to be elite, if you are trying to be an Olympian in something, it is going to take sacrifice and recognizing that before you start um, instead of thinking, hey, I can maintain the exact same things that I'm doing in my everyday life. And I'll say I've definitely done preps where I haven't remained social. Um, and it is just, it's something that being social, it's some, like you want your support group around you. You want people that you can lean on. And yes, there are times that you are going to be less social in prep, but not letting that be the main thing that you're like, well, I just spent all of that time alone because there's a lot to be said about what social interaction helps us as human beings. So um, first thing, here is to recognize that it's your choice and it's your privilege to prep and to diet. If you are purposely restricting food, that is a huge privilege. A lot of people don't have that privilege. And that's always helped me as I'm going through prep to recognize what a privilege that is so that I'm not stuck complaining and making other people miserable around me by constantly talking about how I have to do this thing where I don't have to do it, I get to do it. So switching the mentality of what a prep is, is really helpful just so you're going into it with a positive headspace and you're recognizing what that looks like for you. Um, And you can, of course, vent when it comes to a prep, but recognizing that there's a difference between venting and chronic complaining um, and being able to know where that line is. So If you are going to be with a core group of people, whether it's you're going to see your coworkers every day or you're around family members or you see certain friends all the time, my biggest piece of advice, the number one thing that you can do is sit and have a conversation with them. People don't know what they don't know. If someone has never been around someone prepping or has never heard about a competition prep, it's very hard to not explain it and then just expect someone to completely understand and support it. Not only does explaining things help people 
people have a better understanding and then be more um, inclined and more empathetic towards that situation. But it's also something where you're not having to fight the whole time of trying to explain what's going on or being exacerbated because they're not understanding what's going on. You've given them that base of, hey, this is what you should expect. This is what it looks like for me. Even having a conversation with it, your significant other about, okay, this is what it is going to look like. This is what time is needed out of me. Um, my sex drive might go down. I might be a little bit less animated in conversations. I might be less likely wanting to go out and do things. I'm going to be a little bit tired. So going through all of that, not using any of those as an excuse to just be an awful person throughout prep, but it's sitting down and explaining it to those people near you is so extremely important. And it, it will be a complete game changer as you go throughout the prep as far as what that looks like. And that'll also help so that they're not making comments to make you feel pressured. Um, I'll get into this in a little bit, but people making these comments as far as, um, oh, just a little bite or, oh, this apple is healthy, just eat it. Or, oh, can you not just do it this one time? Those come up from a place of not understanding or from a place of, um, not being secure within their own decisions. And so the more that you tell them exactly what to expect and you put it out there, hey, I don't want these comments, the easier that prep's gonna be in that way because I'm sure each one of us could attest to it's much harder when people aren't on board and don't understand versus when they do understand or when you've given them the chance to understand what's going on within a prep. So getting into um, a few other things here. And this goes more for lifestyle dieting, but it does speak to the maintainability and sustainability within multiple preps. So the moment you turn down a social event or an outing specifically due to dietary restrictions or food is the moment that you define your diet as not being sustainable. Knowing that if you're going into an environment where there is going to be food doesn't mean that you always have to eat it, but it is something that if you completely shut yourself in, if you're shut in, if you are not social, you are completely deeming that what you're doing is not sustainable. And we've spoken multiple times that preps in and of itself and eating that low of food isn't sustainable. And I understand that, but setting yourself up for successful preps down the line, as well as being able to foster relationships, because um, I'm sure there's been people listening who have gone through preps and lost people in their life due to just not being social, not interacting and not explaining different things there. So um, if you, um, for food, food is also very social, like I mentioned, and a lot of people don't have a good handle on their food. So they will project on you and become negative. So some people can become hyper aware of where they're lagging in their life. So if someone doesn't feel comfortable within their body, what they're doing within food, they can project that and then that turn into peer pressure for you or constant comments, but being able to to reflect and recognize what that means, as well as being able to shut that down when it happens. So setting boundaries and being very stern in that instead of letting things just like bottle up inside of you. So being able to say like, hey, I, I appreciate that you are speaking up about this, but this is something I'm choosing to do and I wanna kind of go along. I would appreciate your support on this. Just saying it, it's still friendly, but it's firm as far as what you wanna do within that prep. And that's again, something that's been very helpful is being very firm in what I want to do within a prep and going after it instead of falling into, well, it's making this other person slightly uncomfortable. So I'm just gonna do what they want want and then make myself uncomfortable in the long run because I didn't do what I wanted to do. Um, the other thing is that it can scare people when someone makes a big change because we often think about how it'll affect our relationship with them. So when people start to make comments, it's not always that they're not happy for your change. You might start a fitness journey and people or a prep and people be very excited for you in the beginning. And then they see how much you are changing. And it's some of it could be jealousy as far as wanting to see those results for them themselves or not being able to stick to something. But another part of that could be that they are worried about what that time looks like for you. So let's say that you always have Taco Tuesday or you have wine and you watch The Bachelor on Monday with your friends. If you are switching over to a different type of lifestyle, that can be very hard for your friends because you have bonded so much over food and those situations that come with food. So like I said, food is very, very social. So one thing that you can do to handle social situations in prep is see within those social situations what else you can focus on that you might have not had the most focus on because of food. 
So let's say that you do go and watch The Bachelor and have wine. Instead of making it about the fact that you're not having wine, still go and watch The Bachelor, do all the same things you would do with friends and be able to focus on the conversations and being present instead of focusing on, oh, I can't have wine with my friends and Bachelor isn't the same. Um, So being able to kind of switch, um, again, your mentality. So a lot of this has to do with mentality and then preparation and setting the boundaries that you need for yourself. So the next one is to be um, to pre-plan and be prepared. There's no shame in looking ahead at a menu, asking a host what food is going to be available or what the situation is. Still to this day, even if I'm not in prep, if my parents are like, hey, we're going to go and do this thing when we're visiting, I'm like, all right, how long are we going to be there? What does it look like for food? Should I eat before? Should I bring a snack with me? Am I able to eat there? Just because not only am I a planner, but I like to know what situation I'm going into to feel the most comfortable in a social situation. And that's just for me personally, you might not be like that normally, but within a prep, being able to plan and prepare for that. Another thing that you can do when it comes to food is you can bring your own, um, but you can also offer to host yourself. So it's something that hosting yourself or bringing food for everyone could be very helpful. So let's say that you're going to watch the Super Bowl coming up here, but you're in prep and you're like, well, there's going to be all these snacks and X, Y, and Z making a recipe or a snack that can be shared and put on the table for everyone to eat that you know the macros of and you know that you can be good to go and still feel a part of that social situation. Um, And then bringing your own food or Tupperware to a situation is completely okay. Or if you don't feel comfortable doing that within a certain situation, being able to eat beforehand or afterhand or having a snack. I will say that the questions get less and less when it comes to food if you just, again, are very straightforward about what people can expect from you. Um, So it's something that, and I use my parents as an example just because in my day-to-day life, I'm around people who are bodybuilders who are committed to their health. So I don't face this as much in those situations. But when I'm visiting family, Um, that's when I'm put into those situations more where I'm like, okay, I need to vocalize these things. I need to be aware of how things are going on. But my parents and Alex's parents have become very, um, like, used to asking like, hey, can you go out to eat? Or, hey, we're going to do this, this, and this, but you can eat beforehand or you can bring your own meal. So they're even in the loop with that where they don't even think twice if I bring my own meal or if I sit there and don't eat. A lot of people do have problems or feel uncomfortable if someone goes into a situation or goes to a restaurant and decides not to eat. Um, And it's off for people because it's so unusual and so out of the norm. But doing everything you can to make it seem as normal as possible. There have been multiple times I've gone to lunches, dinners, events, like going out for drinks and just gotten myself a water, been like, oh no, I'm not eating right now. I'm good. Not saying I'm in a diet. I can't eat. I'm in this prep. I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Like taking it away from not talking about it all the time is also very, very helpful as you go through. Um, So being able to pre-plan, prepare, being able to ask about what the situation is going to include food, being able to bring food for yourself, for the group, or offer to host or cook, Um, and then not making it about not doing something, but being able to focus on the situation at hand. Um, And then if people are asking questions about what you're doing or why you're doing it, take that as time to explain to them. This is something that Mackenzie, one of the PD coaches, was talking to me about when people ask her questions. It's something that she uses it as a time to explain what's going on, as a time to educate what's going on. And again, circling back to what I said to begin with is that a lot of this comes from not understanding and then making the comments. So being able to explain yourself is very, very helpful. Um, And then before I go into the last three things, I'll have Alex and Austin touch on anything um, that they think is helpful with it when it comes to social situations and prep, because I'm sure that my voice um, is starting to get a little bit repetitive in your head right now. Yeah, so I'll just point out um, really one thing that I, I think has really stuck with me over the years um, going through preps and whatever else. Um, as much as you want them to know this is your journey, understand that this isn't theirs, right? So I think that's incredibly valuable to know because as much as at the end of the day, you want the best for maybe someone else, Again, understand as Sue pointed out, they're probably scared 
for multiple reasons. You're probably making them uncomfortable. You should expect to be, make people slightly uncomfortable with a, such a lifestyle change if this is a big lifestyle change for you because it's going to be uncomfortable, not only for you, but also for the people in your life because they don't know what comes next, right? And, and one of the scariest things for us, I, I think, is not knowing what comes next, to not know what to expect, right? And in such a large way, your life will change. It's up to you how much, and it's up to you how those relationships are going to change. But at the end of the day, you can't always control it, right? So still show up, be a kind human, understand that this is your journey, but also understand this is not their journey, right? And, and don't put what's on you onto them. As Sue was saying, if you are at a restaurant, there's so many things that you can say other than like, oh, I'm dieting, I'm in a prep, oh my God, woe is me. What you can do is, oh, I ate before. Oh, I'm not hungry, that's okay, I'll just have water. Like, just bl brush it off, ask them a question, move on with it, right? And if they keep prying, well, then explain, maybe. But if they, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, like, this person's either gonna accept it or not, right? And it is probably more uncomfortable at first for people, but at the end of the day, again, this is your journey, not theirs, and that goes both ways. So take ownership of that, take personal responsibility for that. And at the end of the day, you have to communicate with these people that are around you. Um, and, and I think that's really the last thing that I, I wanted to point out there is, is basically what you touched on. It's just the communication is everything here. So um, if you're not communicating on, you know, on everything on a daily basis with, with whether that's your partners or on a weekly basis with your friends or whatever else, as they're maybe getting a little nervous or scared or uncomfortable or, or confused, maybe um, understand that you also have to take a lot, a lot of self responsibility to, to take that upon yourself of like, I understand that this is going to be not only tough for me to endure physically, emotionally, mentally, whatever else, but also understand that the people you care about also are impacted, right? And, and they don't quite, and maybe if they don't know more about the sport or what you're doing, educate them a bit, communicate with them. Because the more they know, the better. And the more they know, the more that they can actually understand and almost be, you know, s sit on your side of the bleachers, if you will, right? Instead of the the opposite. So, Alex, what do you got? That's really all I have. Yeah, I think that uh, the two things I'll add is that um, an old joke, I don't know if this still exists, is that you know someone does CrossFit by just being around them just because it's all they talk about type situation. And so that happens in prep too. Like people who are in prep, all they want to do is talk about prep. And it's like, I, I'm telling you from someone, I mean, being around a lot of people who are like in prep, I suppose, it's better to to have a little bit more things to to speak on than your prep, how things are going, et cetera, et cetera, because that's going to give up about 10, 15 minutes of conversation that you have. And then you've got to have a little bit more depth to you at that point to continue to engage in conversation. So don't make everything like in those social situations about you and about the prep and so on and so forth, like keep things circulating in terms of conversation, as well as when you do go out, um, one, Sue spoke on it being a privilege to be in prep. Two, um, w within that, when you're in these social situations, please don't sit there and, and complain about how hard the prep has been or anything of that nature where, um, again, it was a choice if you didn't like it or you're, you know, it's, it's been too tough and, and all you want to do is, is quit, then I encourage you, quit. <laughs> it's, it, it is, it is a, a luxury. It's all these different things. And if you find that you are in a place where all you want to do is, is complain and you're hating it and so on and so forth, like, then maybe it's not for you. And that's okay. Like, it, competing is not for everyone, I promise you. And um, if you find yourself just chronically complaining, one, take a step back and see, you know, where, where the, the issue is coming from. And I promise you, you'll feel a whole hell of a lot better by not complaining all the time. Yes. And, and that's the huge thing that I wanted to get through is your mindset is such a huge thing within prep. And yes, we've talked about many other things on this podcast as far as sleep and recovery and all these other things that refer to everyday living, dieting, and then prep as well. But when it comes down to it, your mentality can make or break your prep. And if you're constantly in the woe is me, I'm prepping, I'm dieting, life is hard, everyone's out to get me, it will not be a good prep. 
and that will show on stage. And so being able to switch the mindset of what a privilege it is, what availability you have to do this, um, as well as taking time along the way to make space for other people. Like Austin said, while this is a decision that you made, No one else in your life made this decision to be a part of it. And so taking time to still be a human being, and like Alex said, not making your whole personality the fact that you're in a competition prep um, will be very helpful. So the last things are just for being able to have some go-to sentences. Um, I talked about a few of them earlier, but saying something like, this is what's best for me right now. Thank you for understanding or thank you for your support. It means a lot for me. Thank you for respecting my decision or hey, I would appreciate if comments weren't made about this as this is something that I'm going through and these comments are making it a little bit more difficult. Or I would appreciate if you didn't try to push food once I've already said no. Having those firm statements that you go to will just make it easier instead of being caught into this loop of not knowing how to feel and then reverting from social situations. And then the last thing is suck it up. So just because something's there doesn't mean you have to indulge in it. Just because it's hard doesn't mean that you need to complain about it about it. You chose it, suck it up, do the thing. Even if that takes prepping your foods, bringing it in containers or not eating in these social situations. But the best thing you can do in prep is not constantly think about prep. I can tell you that there's been preps where all I do is talk about prep and I'm not social and then I'm just no fun to be around versus my most recent prep was probably the most social I was and the most chill I was in regards to just bringing my food and not mentioning it, just going to an event and not talking about it. Um, And it was a lot easier for me mentally because I wasn't constantly thinking about how much suck there was. So we'll go ahead and move into the next topic. But hopefully those um, those piece of advice were helpful for you if you're dieting or in prep to recognize what you can do to handle those situations. All right. Topic number two, Austin. Should we be performing deloads within our training during? Oh, I changed it. Damn it. I'm reading the wrong notes, everyone. Write notes. Austin, what are some training considerations with clients in prep? (laughs) There we go. That's the right question. So training considerations uh, for people in the prep. um, This is also going to uh, sort of stand for anyone going, you know, not only preparing for a show, but maybe a photo shoot or just trying to get lean or or whatever, right? So again, this is not going to be an exhaustive list, but more so I'm gonna open the floor for further discussion and thought here. So as we program and tailor things to the individual within physique development, I I cannot give absolute statements in exactly what I would do for you in this situation, right? So what I'm gonna do is create that framework for thinking through things uh, and basically where you should be considering or, or how you should be considering prepping a client, prepping yourself, for that show, that shoot, or just getting lean. Okay, so that's kind of the the preface to this to this segment. So questions that you should be asking yourself as you start and progress through a contest prep. Number one, where are we starting things? Do we have a good timeline? And are we able to continue to have enough calories in the diet for good performance and recoverability through the bulk of the prep, right? So as we enter later stages of the prep, obviously, we, we can draw back to, to Sue's statement, suck it up, get over it. This is hard. You signed up for it. This is a part of it where you got to just get through it, man. So in that, that is a part of prep without a doubt. That should not be your whole prep, right? And we're going to get to that segment in uh, segment number three with Alex and that prep to prep, right? You should go into a prep in a, in a situation where you can be in a good spot to actually diet into a show, right? Diet into a show at a good pace where you're not crash dieting. You're not trying to make it happen in 12 to you know twelve to 16 weeks when it needed to be a two-year process or something <laughs> like that, right? So, and we see that happen all the time. And it's one of those things where all of those factors, the better you set yourself up, and again, Alex is gonna talk uh, more in detail about this, but the better you set yourself up, the better you're going to be throughout your prep, the more you're going to thrive and actually be elite at this, which in a big, in a big way, that makes it so much better for the process. If you're actually ready for this, 
right? And that's why, you know, here at Physique Development, we, we do the prep to prep. We really evaluate people before they start a prep. Are we in a good position? Or do we need to, to actually preemptively go through something first, right? So number one, where are we starting things out? Okay, so we have to answer that question. And do we have a good timeline in place? Or, and are we able to keep calories in a good spot from a recoverability standpoint to have good performance, right? So ask that question first. Number two, how does this person perform best in terms of training stimulus, right? Are they someone who thrives in more like neuro-based strength work? Are they someone who thrives in more metabolically driven phases? Are they a high volume person? Are they a low volume person? All of these questions are things as the coach or as the individual, you should be able to answer before a prep begins, right? These are questions that you should know beforehand. And again, goes into the prep to prep, goes into that process where you already know so much about this individual and why you give yourself enough time to prep. Because when it comes to training, you really, really need to know what you're getting into and how that person thrives, right? So you're not pushing on them these long drug out phases where volume is way too high, right? Because you're going to see that in their biofeedback. You're going to see that in their progress, right? We want to be in a stimulus. We want to spend the most time within the stimulus or the stimuli that we best thrive within. And obviously you're going to periodize in and out of other types of training throughout that process, but we should spend the bulk of that time in something or things that we thrive within. Okay. So that's number two. How does that person perform best? You should be able to answer that as the coach or the individual going into that. Number three, are they good at creating tension? Are they good at training? Are they good at the actual fundamental skill of working out and strength training? Can they create tension within their movements? And how are they working into fatigue, right? So if they're not good at working into fatigue, if they bail when sets get hard and they can't keep tension on target muscles and or they have a high probability of getting injured during that set, we need to know that going in, right? We need to know that before we're going to push them in this super fatiguing, high volume, difficult exercise selection type phase. That doesn't mean you can't prep if you can't do that. That just means whoever is prepping you, or if you're prepping someone else, you need to take that into consideration and you need to know that person's skill level before they go in, right? Difference between putting a freshman on freshman or, or varsity if we're talking about if they can dribble or not. Well, you should probably start them at the level they're at first before you put them in a situation where they're not going to do very well at all. And that's not going to be a good situation for you or them. And the end result is going to be atrocious, no doubt, right? So that's number three. Are they actually good at the fundamental skill of training? Can they create tension? Are they good at working into fatigue? So when sets get hard, do they stay in it or do they bail? Do they get injured, right? So things we need to, to answer as well. Number four, what does their life look, look like outside of training? Are they a stressed individual? Do they have a lot on their plate? Are they with work or are they working through a lot of emotional distress with the relationships or responsibilities they have at home? This is going to heavily play into the recoverability and ultimately how hard you're going to be able to effectively push them throughout that prep and throughout their training. Okay. So understand this is going to ebb and flow throughout prep right? You may go through stressful situations. If you're going through a, you know, a six month ordeal, a six month to eight month prep or something, life changes, man. That happens. You're going to have stressful situations. You're going to run into sticky situations. You're going to run into things that stress you out that may put a little emotional distress on you. And you need to be open with your coach or you need to have an open line of communication with whoever you're working with, because that may be the time where you take a step back. And that actually could be better for your progress long-term. That could be better for your progress within that prep. You could see better biofeedback markers, data points, and more progress by actually taking a step back during those times instead of pushing harder because that's what you're supposed to do, right? And so you need to know whether you're on the side of the coach or you yourself or the individual, you need to know how that person's life looks, right? And that's like our weekly check-in process. We get that done. We're constantly staying updated with these people, um, with our clients, and we're in it. And if we need a deload, if we need to take a step back, we need to transition stimulus, we're going to do it. We're going to make it happen to be sure that they're actually in a situation to thrive through that. Number five, I want to lay out basically a tentative schedule for periodization going into the first parts of prep. 
Okay. So for example, this is kind of how I work. When someone comes and they want to go through a prep, for example, and they've already kind of gone through the prep to prep, we're already established that relationship. We already kind of know where they thrive, where they don't, or where they need to work, basically where they need to put work in um, to maybe bring up some weak areas or weak points within whether that's their, you know, aerobic conditioning or, or you know, certain things within within their training as a whole. Those are things where I'm keeping into consideration. I'm creating that tentative schedule for programming and periodization. And then I'm going to make notes and adjustments along the way, right? So I kind of already know the trajectory trajectory that we're headed in. I understand how long we're going to potentially be in a phase and what that's going to lead us into and then what that's going to lead into. And then basically when the show date is, I understand how many phases we're tentatively going to use to get there and what that sort of line of thought in that train of thought looks like. And we're making notes and adjustments along the way based off biofeedback, based off progress, timeline, you, you name it. Okay. So that's another thing that you need to keep into consideration and a question you need to ask yourself when you're considering training, not only starting a prep, but throughout a prep. One thing I'll add to what Austin's talked about there is that as a coach and, and, and having athletes in prep, it's very important to plan ahead with the programming because let's say that you hit a roadblock at earlier than what you expected within a phase and you need to get them out of that phase well you know you, you can't just like create training program on the dot like that and go along with your normal work day so planning out ahead and kind of having that next phase already at least semi ready for them before the fact is very important because you may have to pull them out early and get them into that new phase so you're not wasting a week because in prep you don't have weeks to waste and it would be silly for you to keep somebody in a stimulus that they're unresponsive in and just do it because you're not ready with the next stimulus or what have you. And what he means by unresponsive is, yes, you could be hitting a stall on the scale, but it also could be something that could be causing too much inflammation that you can't recover from with where your food's at, where stress is, where all of that is. So well, as Austin talked about, our form and our biofeedback, we're looking at that full picture. And we've normally had that relationship with a client before a prep so that we're able to go through those situations and understand what the next training phase looks like. Yeah, great points, guys. Thank you. Um, so that's basically my first five. There's seven total. So that's my first five. And those are basically just all about training considerations, general training considerations that you, the coach, or you, the individual, or your coach, if you're working with someone should be taking into consideration. They should be taking these things into account. Do not berate your coach if they haven't talked to you about this, but you can always inquire and they should always be able to have good answers for you. That's all I'm saying. Okay. These things are, these are things that you should be taking into consideration or someone else should be taking into consideration on your behalf as you're going into a prep or through a prep. Okay. So number six and seven are both about exercise selection. Okay. A little bit more in the trenches here. So when it comes to exercise selection, when starting a prep, one of the most helpful things I found is again, during that prep to prep or the phases leading into your prep, you're actually learning and spending time figuring out which exercises work best for you or this individual you're working with, right? Where can we create significant, good amounts of tension? Keep in mind things like stimulus to fatigue ratio. This is basically the opportunity cost of an exercise. So how much good effects do we get versus the opportunity cost or fatigue generated by that exercise, right? So there are things that have, that can create a lot of tension that can do a lot of effective work, but they also create a lot of fatigue, right? And then there's exercises that create a lot of fatigue that, you know, don't do anything as <laughs> well as the other thing that does create a lot of tension, right? Give, give um, examples. Yeah. So something like, you know, if we're looking to train the lower body, look, we're training to, let's get the quads and glutes involved. Okay. Well, if we look at like a conventional deadlift, for example, that has a high fatigue ratio to the stimulus that you're getting from it. But let's look at something like a hack squat. Great for the quads and the glutes. And it's going to have a higher stimulus to the fatigue ratio relative to that opportunity cost of doing that exercise. So you're going to waste less volume. You're going to create less junk volume creating a, uh, even more of a stimulus than you otherwise would 
with the hack squad versus the the deadlift, for example. That isn't to say that deadlifts are useless. That is just to say, especially when you're in a prep and you get deeper into a prep, you need to take these things into account, right? Does that is that a good example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was more so just wanting to pinpoint, like give examples for the exercises, but also um, with with that, we're able to train tissue more frequently, um, right. sustaining tissue better, as well as just getting more frequent work more frequent quality work rather than just looking at, okay, I got all of my sets done and, and it, you know, I, I deadlifted as many sets as I was supposed to do for the entire week this day. And, um, like it's not all created equal. You have to look at it in, uh, the correct context. Yeah. And even something like cardio is something where you have to figure out what works for a person. So I had hit throughout my um, prep or, or in some sections of my prep. And we started with doing bike sprints um, because I didn't I couldn't do running sprints because I didn't feel confident enough in my form. And especially with the level of fatigue I was at, it didn't make sense to put me in sprint sprints. Um, and so I did bike sprints, but it was eliciting far too much inflammation for the benefit we got from doing hit. So I had to switch it over to doing battle ropes, but that was something that my coaches were able to understand and be able to put into place for how do we get the most bang for our buck without causing this mess of uh, inflammation or this mess of fatigue that we can't really like risk right now. We don't have time to, to waste. Yeah. And everything's so contextual. And I love that you guys bring that up because it's, that's why it is individualized and tailored and all of these words are definitely have turned into more of a buzzword, more of a sales pitch, more of a marketing thing. But when we speak about these things, and there's a reason we're going over this, as you can see, there's a lot of nuance to context. There's a lot of nuance to individualization and actually creating a tailored program, right? So that's, again, why we're going over a bulk of this is just to introduce you to those concepts, to those ideas, and to those questions that you should be asking yourself, your coach, or critically thinking about as you're starting or going through a prep of any kind. A prep could be a prep of fat loss or whatever else. It's prepping yourself to do something hard, essentially. Um, a contest prep just has a show at the end, essentially is the difference, right? And you may actually dig a bit harder and sacrifice a little bit more to do it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a prep to do something challenging and tough, right? Last one here I want to mention, um, number seven, again, getting a little deeper into that nuance. And this is the last one, I do promise. Thanks for sticking with us. The deeper you get into a prep, <clears throat> The more you have to manage things like fatigue, recoverability, stabilization of the spine, for example, during big movements, this is the difference of like that deadlift example versus a hack squat, right? Very similar tissue that's going to be involved, but the need to stabilize, stabilize the spine and the sacrifice that you're going to have to have there in terms of stimulus to fatigue ratio, risk of injury, et cetera, is going to be much different. And that's something you need to manage throughout not only a session, but throughout prep and throughout each phase. Okay, so this is where you may start out with something like, in a different example, a back squat, but, but to progress something more resembling a hack squat or a leg press or something machine-based, basically with less risk of injury, the deeper we get into a prep. Okay, so again, just an example and just a consideration, but at the end of the day, the deeper you, you get into the prep, things you need to consider are fatigue, right? Recoverability, how often are we having to stabilize the spine? How often are we loading the spine um, within these sessions, right? So if you go through a, if, you, if your leg day loads the spine on every exercise and you're hitting leg, legs two to three times a week, trust me, you're gonna feel it, right? And that has a very high fatigue to stimulus ratio rather than the high stimulus to fatigue ratio. Meaning the higher stimulus to fatigue ratio we have, the more stimulus we're getting per the fatigue that is basically accrued or gained during that exercise, right? So we want a higher stimulus to fatigue ratio rather than a fatigue to stimulus, if that kind of makes sense. Um, more bang for our buck in layman's terms. Yeah, I mean, training and prep is a very, very uh, challenging thing. I think that um, if, if we were to really outline, this is the most complex time that you're designing training program because you can really screw things up and put a client into a place of um, losing muscle tissue or uh, stalling their fat loss because of the improper training uh, being put into place or not having the nutrition paired with the, the training, all those different components. So everything that you're doing in a, an improvement season or a lifestyle client or what have you, everything just becomes magnified and you've got to be even that much more detail oriented. And you're, I mean, later into the prep itself, you're 
exposing yourself if you aren't prepared essentially if you if you haven't been taking that data if you haven't been um you know tracking things for your client and really personalizing things it's going to show on stage it's going to show in those later stages of prep where they're just not having a good response because um the data is not matching up or the the protocols are not matching up to that specific individual yeah and the other thing i was going to say because we are talking about deep in prep is that when you are very close to a show rest is so, so, so important. A lot of people want to run themselves into the ground and they've been pushing all prep and they've been struggling. They've been grinding and it's hard and they're, they're relishing in the hard. You've gotten past the part of trying to not make it hard. And now you're relishing in the hard and you love it. And it's hard to not go as hard, but you do need to pull back. Um, there's many a times where someone comes and they're just like an inflamed blob because they've been pushing too much. And it's not that they don't have muscle or that their their physique isn't there. It's just they need to put their feet up and rest. Um, so don't be afraid to pull back at the very, very end. You're not going to be doing your world's heaviest lift the, the week or two before a show. You're not going to be running yourself into the ground with cardio or you probably shouldn't be the week or two before be. show. Be. Yeah, yeah, you should be ready beforehand, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, but do not underestimate rest and recovery all throughout your prep and especially at the end. And it's something that you can lose muscle if you do push yourself too hard. So having a deep understanding of the training stimulus is also helpful as well as understanding the client let's say someone doesn't have the muscle to lose on their lower body. Maybe you're doing more neurological work. You're just trying to maintain the muscle. You're not doing anything metabolic for their lower body. Maybe you can do metabolic for upper body and that's completely fine. But for lower body, you're just trying to maintain the tissue and make sure nothing else is coming off. So be very aware of what that looks like. It's not all about just pushing into the ground and grinding because you're tough and you're prepping. Um, so it, it does feel weird. I will say the last week or two, when Alex started to pull things back, I was like, no, I got to push. And he was no like, no, got to rest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> yeah. And, and another thing to add to that is there's, there's been many a times of the past years uh, where we have individuals come to us that are four to eight weeks out and they are just uh, not seeing any fat loss. They're not happy with their, their coaching experience or what have you. And we step in and there are times where I completely, or, or one of us pulls back on their cardio completely, moves them to outdoor walks. We take them from six days of training generally to three days or something of that nature. And then all of a sudden we see fat loss for the first time in a month. Um, and they're like, this makes no sense. We give them more food, those type of scenarios. Now, is that, is that all encompassing? Absolutely not. That's specific to the case study itself, but, um, it, it's all individually dependent, but oftentimes in those scenarios where you're just fighting, 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 and you're like, your body is being so resilient to the fat loss or what have you, you've got to take a step back and understand that the, all the pieces that go into you losing the body fat that you want to lose. Yeah, exactly. So with that, to be able to make sure that you are ready, Alex, what is the prep to prep and why does someone need to do it? Man, this is one that we get so many questions on and there's so many, like maybe uh, past this uh, podcast, if you guys would be interested, we may come with like multiple case studies of individuals who have had different types of, of prep to preps um, to, to give you guys some a little bit of greater context, you know, mm -hmm. um, where like all of them are different. And I think that the prep to prep is is getting you into a position to have a successful prep. Oftentimes, individuals will turn the switch from improvement season directly into prep. And it, it is two different ways of living for one, as well as do we know that everything is in the best place possible from that improvement season into uh, that prep? Are you in actual shooting range from a, a fat loss standpoint to get into a prep and have that successful prep without having to do uh, un, un believable amounts of cardio or what have you like we want to get you in the best spot possible before you start that prep to make that as as successful as it can be reason being is that competing is expensive um that is i mean through and through it is not a cheap hobby to have or if you're looking to make a profession out of it um, it is not a cheap profession to have 
And then beyond that, um, it is it is hard on your body. You cannot just prep eternally, essentially. This is a, a short-term extreme that we're trying to achieve. So we want to keep this window of time as small as we, we can uh, possible in terms of prep. Now, excluding the 2020 season, uh, cli- <laughs> clients who are listening, like, this does not apply to you because 2020 was such a wild year and uh, unpredictable. But we want to keep that window of time of prepping as short as we can um, from a hormonal function perspective. Um, metabolic perspective, thyroid function, all those different components. We want to keep it as short as possible. And then from there, it also just makes things more enjoyable. We can keep you, we can keep you healthier through the prep. We can uh, sustain more muscle tissue. We can uh, bring a better physique to the stage. And all, all these things are of benefit to us, but we've got to prep to prep. And within the prep to prep, the duration of this is going to be different for everyone. Um, I like to, so I'm talking perfect case scenario of how I like to go about this is that within the prep to prep, we diet very hard for about four to six weeks. We peel off about five to 10 pounds in that time frame. You're like, holy shit, that's a lot of weight in that short amount of time. You're correct. It is a lot. It is very tough in that time frame. It's very um, like go, go, go and and fast pace. And then from there, it'll be four to six weeks of, of maintenance phase leading into the prep itself. So you've got that small amount of time frame. We'll, we will get blood work, make sure that everything is is in a good place, uh, natural or enhanced at that point. It gives us a, a baseline of where your blood work is at before the prep starts. We can take a look at all those pieces that I just spoke on, uh, sex hormone production, thyroid function, uh, uh, cortisol, all those different pieces to make sure that everything is in a good place before we start the prep. And then um, that's the, the kind of the, the time frame, if you will, of, of how to go about things. Austin already spoke on how um, you want to kind of target the the training aspect of things and understanding where the athlete is going to be successful, what type of training stimulus they are best performing in. And this is a great time to gather that data. It's a good time to trial um, where they're at from a, a, a dietary perspective within, okay, we saw a good response at this intake. We can kind of move and groove here. Um, and then also finding that maintenance set point to where they're still seeing that response. Because oftentimes what we see is that within that aggressive four week cut or at the very beginning from the maintenance, or I'm sorry, from the improvement season into the prep to prep. What we see there is that we'll see that drop off in weight. Now we will see a little bit of higher inflammation response just because of the larger deficit that's been created calorically. And then so from there, once you come out of the dieting phase and move into the maintenance phase, you'll continue to see some fat loss transpire as that inf- or more so scale readings um, decreasing because that inflammation is going to fall off as well. And we get into a place of now we like at the tail end of that maintenance phase, we utilize a deload from a training standpoint. So get them basically re- sensitized to all different stimuli of, in terms of training. And now we're ready to hit the ground running for however long that prep is. In a perfect world, I like to get, uh, I'll speak on bikini athletes most specifically because that is a, a large portion of our clientele. I like to get athletes at that point between 12 and 15 pounds from stage weight to make it even you know easier on us to, again, do all those things that we spoke on in the prep itself. Yeah. And the, the, the huge reason that this is beneficial, not only to give your coach the data, especially if you haven't gone through a deficit, you're understanding how their body works and what's going to be the best, but it gets you within that shooting range for weight because losing an ex- a large amount of weight for prep only makes it that much harder. Not only the internal things that it does as far as all the systems that it's putting you through of losing 30 plus pounds within one stint, it's also the look that your body gives because you are exhausted from losing that much weight. Your body is very worn down. It's going to be a harder look to fine tune towards the end because your body has been through so much. Um, So for myself, I went a a long time without dieting and then I dieted for about 15 weeks and then I took 15 weeks to reverse before going into my prep. Not only was I able to resensitize a lot of my body and put it in a better spot, but I was able to lose about 10 pounds and be in such better starting position before starting my prep so I wasn't having to just be absolutely 
absolutely miserable as I'm trying to get this weight off within this time period. So that's a huge, huge part of it is making your prep easier, not only on your coach because they have more data and understanding of your body, but on your body itself because prep is hard and we want to make it as easy as we can within making sure that you're in shooting range. Yeah. And the better striking distance you're in, the the better <clears throat> the better and more enjoyable your training is, the more enjoyable the entire process is and the more social you can be and, and et cetera. Everything falls into place. And my best preps by far have been the ones where I started out, you know, in striking distance. And I, I can't say I've been too far off in any of them, but the one I was the closest <clears throat> by far was my best. It was my healthiest. It was my most effective and, and productive one. I looked the best at the end. I actually was able to feed into the show, um, which is, you know, something that if you're able to do it, do it, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. that's, it, that's definitely a luxury. I'll say that it's not, you know, it's, it's very contextual to the individual. It's, it's something like, you know, <sighs> this is something almost I, I see as like, you know, a reverse diet looks like magic on the people that they need, who need it most, but it's non-existent basically to the people who don't need it. Right. It's like, you'll have people that essentially are like, Oh, I just need to do a reverse diet. And they do it. And they're like, well, nothing happened. And then it's like, well, my friend, you know, started eating 2000 more calories and now she's shredded and whatever else. And it's like, well, she probably needed it and you did not. Right. <laughs> right. And so that's sort of like feeding into a show. It's like, sometimes you don't need it. Right. Um, but when you do and you can do it or you're ready early or you were in, within better striking distance, um, man, it, it makes all the world of difference. And again, tweaking the look again, it's, it's, that's such a big thing is being able to know what you're looking for to have, you know, have a handful of weeks where you can sort of manipulate things, go through potential mock peak weeks and whatever else. That way you're not just like shoot from the hip if it is your first show. Right. So. And if your coach does suggest a different timeline than you had in mind, be grateful instead of frustrated um, there's a girl, uh, there's been multiple girls who have recently come to us being like, oh, I want to prep for a show like in 16 weeks. And it's like, all right, we can do a diet, we can bring food back up and we can plan for a prep later in the year, but you're not going to bring your best. Like Alex said, it's extremely expensive and it's not worth trying to rush it to waste that money and to waste everything that you're going to go through within a prep to not look the best that you can within that circumstance. So I would say to be very respectful if your coach does give a different timeline because they are looking out for you in that respect. Yeah. And, and, and on that same topic, it, you're going up there to win. And, and so we want to do everything in our power leading up to that to make that uh, the reality uh, if you and, and you keep that in your mind as you go through the improvement season. And I think that social media exacerbates this where, um, you know, getting to that 400 carb marker uh, in your off season and it's like, okay, cool. But how do you look like, are we going to have to peel 30, 40 pounds off of you in the prep? Like, what's the point of getting to 400 carbs? Um, probably, uh, really throwing off your insulin sensitivity, uh, just accruing more body fat, um, just to simply be like, Hey, look at me, I'm eating 400 carbs. Whoop, whoop. Like it, it's, it's really not that important. Um, and it wasn't that fun. I can tell you right. from experience. And, and, and that's more expensive too. I mean, you want to go to the grocery and, and, and get the 400 carbs for every day or type situation. Um, and so the, like the prep to prep is very dependent on and the success of it is very dependent on how well you treat your improvement season because there are clients that I've had just in this past year who had uh, poor uh, adherence following their shows in, in 2019 or 2020. And so their prep to preps were true dieting phases. We had to take 12 to 14 uh, weeks of, of real dieting to get them into a place where they're even potentially ready to compete. And then we take 12 to 14 weeks, and then we've got another probably eight to 10 weeks of being at maintenance and getting our reversing out of that, getting them to a maintenance to even start the prep. So now you're looking at just six months almost of, of correcting the the poor adherence that you had before that just to actually get into the prep to have a successful prep. And I think that one that, uh, is, is very frustrating from uh, both parties, the coach and the client. Uh, and, and you want to avoid that as much as possible. And you're, you know, that starts with day one, following your, your previous show or, or what have you going to the, into that next show. Yeah. So 
Just don't get upset about it because oh, we know it stinks if you do have to change your timeline, but it is for the betterment of everything that you are doing. Um, and we want to win. We we don't want to we don't want to lose. Trust me, it's no it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a great sort of three segment breakdown of our per- first real dedicated <clears throat> sort of prep series podcast. I, I think I think that was really good, and it kind of gives you guys an idea of things you should be considering, whether that comes from a social standpoint, a training standpoint, or the prep to prep, getting yourself even into a position to go through a contest prep. So um, hopefully you guys can ask yourself better questions, ask your coach when you're looking for a coach or whatever, be sure you can think of through these things and, and be able to answer them yourself or have that you know coach you're reaching out to be able to at least give you uh, a good ballpark of what they're thinking along that same line. So. <clears throat> again thank you guys for listening if you have any questions reach out to us on uh on instagram and or you can contact us through our website and i'll leave sue here uh she has anything else to, to say and she doesn't have anything else to say okay <laughs> um alex you got anything else to say no i'm good awesome <laughs> awesome well that was it thanks guys uh see, see you guys. next time